Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another Ask Me Anything session. Uh, my name is Chris Wilshire. I'm the Director of Data Programs here at Unitech. And today's topic is cybersecurity and how to protect your business from uh, a cyber attack. Before we begin, I uh, just want to set a few housekeeping or go through a few housekeeping items for our session. Um, we are recording the session today. Uh, and it will be made available through the Communitech website uh, at a later date, with, along with all of our uh, other Ask Me Anything sessions. Um, we do ask that you please uh, keep your mic on mute uh, throughout the session. Uh, and if you do have questions, please use the chat feature. Uh, we will monitor that throughout the course of the session and ensure that we get to as many of the questions as we can over the course of the next hour. And lastly, uh, this session is meant to provide general guidance. Um, obviously, when we're dealing with cybersecurity, um, you know, things are very specific to your particular organization. Um, so this certainly will provide you some general guidance in terms of the things that you should consider or things you should do. Um, but, uh, but certainly, you know, seek out additional guidance or additional expertise as needed um, to begin implementing things within your own organization. I'd also just like to let you know of some up, upcoming Ask Me Anything sessions. So next Tuesday, we have the COVID-19 Toolkit for Businesses. Uh, and then on June 1st, we have Creating Your Cap Table. Um, so check the Communitech website and uh, you'll find the registration link under the events uh, section there to register for those sessions. So pleased to introduce our speaker today, um, John Zvazic. Uh, he is the founder and principal consultant uh, with Elite Sec. And uh, John, maybe I'll pass it over to you and just let you kind of introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your background. Sure, thanks, Chris. Uh, hello, everyone. So my name is John Zvazic. As Chris mentioned, I'm the founder and principal consultant at Elite Sec, which is the local boutique white glove uh, cybersecurity consultancy group. Uh, we specialize in startups and scale-ups. Basically, if you're in the B2B space or if you're getting into that enterprise sales cycle and you're working with larger organizations who are now starting to question what is your cybersecurity um, sort of stance and procedures and policies and all these other wonderful things that people ask about and those words scare you, then by all means, I'm here to help. So, uh, I've been in the field for a long time. I've, I've actually been in the region most of my career. I think I took one year when I, I went down to Toronto and quickly turned around and said, no, I much prefer our smaller community over here. There's far less uh, um, madness, let's put it that way, uh, here. So I've been in, in the IT field probably 25 years. I've uh, shift focus to cybersecurity probably for the last 10, give or take. Uh, I have an extensive background. I've worked in lots of different organizations and, you know, EliteSec is my uh, kind of my passion project right now. I am the director of IT and security at Avic Networks as well, but uh, for all intents and purposes for this conversation, I am representing myself in EliteSec here. But having said that, again, lots of experience with lots of different companies, everything from startups to, you know, the heydays of RIM, um, you know, I've seen quite literally everything. I've worked in, in five person shops where we've uh, dealt with rather interesting types of individuals to working at, uh, like I said, Blackberry, Exonify, Avic, D2L, you name it. I've probably worked in one of the local companies for a while, save for open text. I think that's, that's one bullet I managed to dodge for a while, but uh, nonetheless, uh, I am here to, uh, to share as much knowledge as I possibly can. That's great. Thanks, John. Um, so before we start getting into the questions for John, um, I actually want to uh, just do a quick poll of the audience. Uh, if you give me a second here, I'm going to share my screen again. And um, you should see uh, a question up here. Um, if you have your phone handy or uh, a second browser window handy and you want to go to uh, open that browser, go to menti.com. And you see the code at the top, you'll be prompted to enter that code. Um, we'd love it if you would just go in. We've got three questions that we just kind of want to pull the audience, get a bit of a sense as to you know, where everybody's coming from, what they're hoping to get over the course of the next hour. And um, so we'll give you a minute to kind of go through those. And, um, and then we'll, we'll kind of walk through the, the responses that we get 
and uh, and then we'll dive into some questions with jo with uh, John and have him uh, start uh, giving you all the great knowledge that he has around uh, cybersecurity. So as we're starting to get some responses here, John, uh, anything you see that's sort of standing out to you? It seems like uh, um, a lot of people here are saying that there, there's certainly some things that they've taken uh, already in terms of addressing security within their organizations. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 pos the securing password policies and making sure that people are rotating passwords and whatnot regularly and making sure you've got solid password policies, that's pretty standard. So that's good to see that people have that going on at their organizations. Um, the honesty of the 6% of you that are saying none of the above, that's you know good on you, it's not surprising. Um, and and it's, it's reasonable in, in, for a lot of organizations, especially smaller ones, because security is a cost center. And because it's a cost center, a lot of people don't want to, to do it. And I hate to admit it, but security in general, cybersecurity, information security, whatever label you want to put it on, I'll probably just call it security for the sake of simplicity. It's, it's known to be the department of no. I want to do this, no. I want to be able to bring this thing, no. And usually if you tell people no enough times, they'll just stop asking you. And so they end up going and saying, look, I have a business to run. I need to do my job. I don't have time to sit there and uh, get permission for everything. And so a lot of times that's why we see kind of this resistance up until something happens. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh my God, now we really need to do something. And what we've seen over the last number of years is more and more vendors are being questioned by their customers. What is your security policy? What is your stance on security in general, what steps have you taken? Um, password policies are fairly easy to implement. We're all kind of used to that over time. Limiting access to data, that's fantastic. Uh, securing the IT infrastructure, again, great to see. Um, and a lot of things, usually what we find is if people know about it, they know enough to lock it down. Where we run into trouble is when people lose sight of what they have. And that's, that's somewhat interesting. The 8% on documenting cybersecurity policies is somewhat surprising because that's usually one area where we see people generally lack. They do the right thing. They just don't write it down. Um, sometimes we have the opposite effect. They write it down, but nobody follows it. So there's kind of, again, that, that balancing act. But having, having policies is one thing. Being able to enforce them is another. Um, Training, that's good. That's actually a higher number than I expected. Um, usually, again, what we find is just like all things security related, uh, end user training and that awareness training doesn't always happen. Uh, it's kind of an afterthought. And again, it usually takes some sort of incident before people start to realize, oh, we should probably do something there. Um, so that that's a, a, good, a good number to see, actually. Excellent. So let's uh, move on to the next question here and see what uh, responses we got. Oh, so uh, if you've got your your um, browser open, uh, you should have the next question available to you now. And for those of us that just joined us, if you have a, a phone handy or a browser window handy, uh, you want to open menti.com and use the code that you, appears at the top of the screen. Um, you can follow along in the questions and uh, and provide your input as well. So far, we're seeing almost a, a third of people saying they don't have any challenges. <laughs> I want to come work for you guys if you have no challenges whatsoever. That's amazing. Make your job easy, John. <laughs> That'd be fantastic. I want to I want to drink your your secret sauce there. So so far we're seeing uh, you know a large number of them just saying not not really sure where to start. Um, you know, is that something that you I'm, I'm assuming, but uh, would love to hear from you. Is that something that's fairly common with the folks that kind of reach out to you? 
A hundred percent. You know, it's it's cybersecurity in general is a very, very big field. Uh, even people, when they say, hey, I want to get into cybersecurity, there's so many options that you can go in. But when we look at it from a perspective of an organization and they say, we need to increase security, what does that mean? Right. What exactly does that mean? And, you know, what what do we have to address? So a lot of times what I end up doing is I come in and we say, OK, well, let's start with what do you do for your business? And let's start asking some, some pointed questions like, what keeps you up at night? And I'm not gonna ask that of the CEO. I'm gonna go down to the IT tech who has to respond or the, whoever's on call and say, hey, what keeps you up at night? What are you afraid is going to happen? And let's talk about those things first. And then we'll take a few steps back and we'll say, okay, great. So we've identified areas where you have sensitive um, data or just in general, you're sensitive to these systems because if something like this system went down, that would make for a very bad day. And then we kind of walk back from there. So for those of you who have no challenges, you know, congratulations, and I'm proud of you for, for that, that view. And it very well may be you've asked all these questions uh, and, and that's great. So let's make sure that we haven't missed anything. So a lot of things that I like to do, especially when working with an organization that has no idea where to begin, is using some sort of framework, a security program framework. I'm a big fan of the CIS controls where we've got 20 different controls. We're gonna walk through them. Do you have a full inventory of all your hardware assets? What about all your software assets? Oh, we're in the cloud. That's fine. Do you know every server your cloud has access to? When's the last time you took a look to see who's logged in? When's the last time you rotated your API keys? What about all these other things? Oh, what about dev environments? Do you have those locked down? Or you kind of say, yeah, the devs take care of their own stuff and kind of leave it at that. These are the types of questions that sometimes they don't get asked. And so you don't know, you know, the, the common adage is you can only protect what you know about the things that you're not necessarily aware of. That's where things can come around and bite you. Absolutely. So the last question um, we'd love, just love to get from the audience. Um, just give us a sense of what you're hoping to kind of get uh, out of the, uh, the next sort of hour or so. Um, and it may help us sort of guide the conversation a little bit as well. And John, um, maybe while um, the audience is, is starting to um, sort of populate some answers here, um, I guess going back a little bit to, you know, just the importance of cybersecurity and sort of the why, like why organizations need to be considering this. And, and you know, as you said, it's a, a cost center. It's one of those things that, you know, doesn't necessarily make money for the organization. So why is it that organizations should be taking this more seriously and starting to investing, uh, invest time and effort into um, actually making this happen? Yeah, so it, it generally boils down to my, my experience is organization. So I see in in uh, in the chat there, Addison had mentioned in other general lack of interest. Uh, this is a very common thing. It is cybersecurity in general is considered a cost center. It's considered a luxury. It's not something that comes uh, front of mind and top of mind for everything. But oftentimes what ends up happening is organizations, especially as they grow and they start working with larger companies, two things happen. Uh, larger customers will start asking you about these things and they'll ask you, what is your posture? What is your program look like? And if you don't meet those requirements, then you're not really going to get very far in the sales cycle. And that can trip you up pretty bad. And then all of a sudden it does turn into a business um, consideration because now you're holding up revenue because you're not meeting the requirements of some of your larger vendors. And again, when we're talking larger vendors, um, spend time with John, you guys are cute. Um, there's, definitely, uh, there's definitely impact there. Um, the other thing is when something bad does happen, right? When all of a sudden you do have an incident and now you've got a potential black mark against your name because now you're associated with the breach and you're the latest headline. Um, the reality is not every breach gets reported, not everything makes a news headline, but if you have five customers and you suffer a breach, if you manage to keep three of them after the end of that breach, you're, you should be considered fortunate. 
right? Because you are going to have an exodus of, of uh, individuals and, and individual customers when that comes into play. So I love to compare uh, security with insurance for your organizations. Would you go into business without any, any liability insurance? Most of you will probably say, no, like what's wrong with you? I can't do that. The last thing I want to have is something that uh, an event occurs and my customers sue me into oblivion and now I've got nothing. So security is the same way. So instead of facing a lawsuit, what about facing loss of all your data? Those are, that's essentially a good way to, to consider it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great analogy. Absolutely. Uh, so just looking through some of the responses, um, you know, I think that that sense that we kind of saw a little bit from from the previous question, just kind of about learning where to start um, is one that I'm, I'm kind of seeing. Um, obviously, you've got some fans in the audience, so. <laughs> okay. Right. Yeah, these so, are good, good questions. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. So this is great. Um, so I think, you know, the question that I'll, I'll pose to you now, John, um, we've got a bit of a sense of where the audience uh, wants to go is, you know, what should an organization consider when they're thinking about starting down the path of creating their cybersecurity program? What are sort of the, the first things they need to consider and, and the steps that they should be taking in order to, you know, begin kind of framing that out and, and putting that in place? So probably the very first place I would suggest you start is what I love to call table stakes. Get the security table stakes out of the way. And what do I mean by security table stakes? I mean, the bare minimum that you should do as an organization to help uh, ensure you have at least the bare minimum bar um, to set up. And those are fairly straightforward. They're not as hard as, they, as it may seem. Enable two-factor authentication on everything, email especially. In this day and age, there's literally no reason why you can't enable two-factor authentication on email. Um, do it. You know, if it's a pain, your users are going to say, "Oh, I don't want to have to pull up my phone every single time I want to log in." You know, most Office 365, or um, if you're looking at G Suite, all of them will probably prompt you once, and then they kind of will pay attention to what machine you're logging in from again. And as long as it's the same machine, it's not gonna prompt you for that second factor uh, moving forward. But it's not a, it's not a panacea, uh, panacea. It doesn't solve everything, but it does raise that bar ridiculously high. The second thing that I would consider table stakes would be make sure that all your machines, especially your endpoints, what your users are using, you know, your employees at your company, make sure they're running antivirus and make sure they can't turn it off. So most modern antivirus will actually have the ability to prevent people from uninstalling the, uh, the software from their laptop. Some may laugh and say, really, who's gonna do that? Oh, the stories I could tell. You know, from engineers who claim that it's slowing down their build process to executives that are saying, well, it's not letting me go to the shady site and I just really wanna go get a, get a deal on a, a new leather wallet or something else that I, I found on some really weird Russian website. Uh, there are lots of excuses on why people want to disable these things. Don't let them. And then finally, the, the one thing I would say would be get people to patch, have some sort of means by monitoring what do people have installed and is it up to date? Is the browser up to date? Is the operating system up to date? And this goes for laptops, desktops, and cloud services, right? If you are hosted in Azure, Google Cloud, Amazon, make sure that the systems that you have are actually um, patched properly and you're doing that regularly. And if you, if you do that, those would be the things that I would consider table stakes. Um, start there. If you have all those things in place already, notice I didn't say anything about making sure you rotate passwords every 90 days or whatever the ridiculous statement is. That's a longer discussion well beyond this AMA, uh, but that's not necessarily something I, I would recommend. But if you did do all these things in place and you wanted to say, okay, now what? What's next? I would start by looking at uh, getting yourself a security program. 
And like I said, I'm a big fan of the CIS controls. You can Google those. You can reach out to me afterwards. I can tell you exactly what it is. Uh, it, it gives a really good framework to kind of build a security program for the company, not a particular department. That's a common misconception. Oh, I only have to worry about uh, development or I only have to worry about finance or I only have to worry about my support team. No, you want to do this across the board. Uh, I've, you know, personal experience your support team's usually pretty good at stopping those social engineers who call in and try to figure out, hey, what's, what sort of information can I get from you? Those guys are pretty good. Usually where you run into problems is with executives and with uh, marketing, believe it or not, because marketing loves to share as much information as possible because so they can generate as many leads as possible, but it also it leads to a pretty interesting target you may have locked down, for example, you may have locked down your production environment for your SaaS application, but when's the last time you scanned your own website to make sure that it's not potentially uh, able to be taken over by an attacker? A lot of times we kind of have this laser sight focus on this is where my sensitive data is located and I'm only going to focus on that, but really what we need to do is take a wider view and everyone in your organization should at least have some basic understanding. So, absolutely, absolutely, um, and I know we've had a, a few people that have kind of joined us um, after sort of our my initial intro. Um, if you do have any questions for John, uh, please feel free to um, add them to the chat, and we will certainly get to them over the course of uh, the rest of the session. Um, so, John, you kind of talk, touched a little bit on on this, and, and would love to hear you kind of elaborate maybe a bit more. Um, what are some of the biggest mistakes that you see companies make when they're actually implementing their security program? So a couple of things that uh, mistakes people make when it comes to implementing a security program is a very heavy handed approach. Thou shalt do everything at once. Nothing is going to turn off your users more than coming down with a Bible-sized stack of papers that say, these are the policies we're going to implement, and we expect you to understand all of them up front and, and make sure you don't screw anything up. The best thing that you can do is come up, identify what you have, identify where their gaps are, and then work on implementing controls for the most sensitive or the most uh, critical areas first. Get people to buy in. Start small. Turn on 2FA if you don't have 2FA enabled. Trust me, that's going to be enough of, of, of a change to rock the boat for a lot of people that implementing something like that is probably going to be a good first step. You get some immediate benefit because it does raise the bar, but at the same time, you're slowly introducing changes to the organization. There will be uh, areas that you have to be a little more uh, drastic with. Generally, when we're talking about um, startups, scale-ups, and SMBs, you'll have a group of, of people in the executive who maybe have access to systems they helped set up two, three, 10 years ago that no longer have a need to have that access. But everyone is afraid to tell them, you don't need that anymore, I'm gonna cut you off. This is the benefit of having somebody like myself as a consultant who can come in because I have no qualms. You hired me to tell you what's wrong. The first thing I'm going to tell you is your CEO does not need to have access to the production database. They just don't. I don't care if they feel that they have a right to have access to it. It's not part of their day-to-day -day job. And having that access is a liability. So again, we talked about in one of the earlier questions, what are some of the controls people are doing? Protecting that data, a bunch of you said, we're already doing that. It's fantastic. How many of you have told your CEOs or other executives, no, you don't have a need to have access to that. If, there's not, if it's not part of their day-to-day, -day, they shouldn't need it. If they need data from that system, they can ask someone. Make sure that you have the ability to view what's going on. Those are more drastic steps. And when we talk about department of no, that's kind of where we get that reputation. No, you can't, Mr. or Mrs. CEO, have access to that database but I really want it. I understand that, but there is a liability for you to have it because if your account were ever taken over, because guess what? 
because you are the head of the organization, you will become a target. And as such, people will try to pretend to be you. And we need to make sure that we kind of limit what you're able to access and what people are willing to give you uh, without going through some sort of other justification or, or validation. Right. So that's that's essentially one of the one of the ways that I would start. Right. Don't go heavy handed. Start very small. Identify the critical areas. Focus on those first and then go from there. Right. Absolutely. Uh, so we did have a question that sort of popped up, up in the chat. So we'll get to that. Um, so what are your thoughts on techniques which circumvent inbound firewall rules? For example, using an outbound connection to set up two-way tunnel using a WebSocket. And they did clarify that this question may be too specific. <laughs> no, this is what we call very smart engineers trying to bypass your security controls. So we can get real technical. You get yourself an EDR and uh, find the processes that they're using to, to trigger these and kill them. Um, the other thing is do much more restrictive firewalls, including egress as well as ingress rules. Um, have a sit down. The, probably the first thing I would do is have a sit down with the individual or individuals that are doing this and ask them why. What are they trying to do? What are they trying to accomplish? Again, we don't want to say no to every single thing. If people are doing it just because they feel like they can't do something, they can't do their job because of it, chances are try to understand what is it that they really want to do as opposed to let's look at the solution they're proposing and try to find some sort of workaround. If there's legitimate need, then you know what? There's legitimate need. Let's set up a VPN for you instead. If you do have to go through this, this, uh, this system, if you have to go through all these elaborate steps to get what you want, okay, what's the root cause? Start by understanding. And by the way, this helps diffuse situations like you wouldn't believe. If you approach them and say, what is the problem you're trying to solve? Let me help you achieve that without putting the rest of the organization at risk. Again, if you don't know why they're doing it or what they're doing it for, or heaven forbid, they're doing it without telling you and you find out afterwards and your blood starts boiling and you're like, I want answers now. I'm not saying I've ever done that, but those are the types of things that uh, warrant a deeper discussion. And if you have that discussion, you can generally find consensus and you'll find a better, more secure way for them to do what they're hoping to do. Or you have a deeper discussion with their manager, their director, their VP or HR, really, depending on, on the risk that this is posing to the organization. Because a lot of times people don't understand the risk that they're proposing or that they are posing to the company because they're circumventing certain controls like this. Great. So uh, next question that I have for you uh, is, what are some of the top threats that you see that fa organizations are facing from a security perspective? There's probably two that are, that are the biggest threats that I can see, like maybe three. Uh, that any size organization, doesn't matter if you're uh, Fortune 100 or if you're basically starting your fortunes with $100. Um, phishing absolutely is one of the biggest things that come and bite you. Uh, phishing can take many different forms. It can be the email that comes in uh, that looks legitimate. Uh, we're way past the point of looking for things like poorly spelled uh, email letters that are coming in or, or other things. We have lots and lots of examples of organizations being uh, fooled by phishing emails that look incredibly legitimate. Uh, when I'm uh, at Avic, for example, I do phishing exercises regularly. I have phished most of my executives and these are very smart individuals. I have fished one of the uh, most crusty individuals from Blackberry's days who swore up and down that I would never catch him. And I did. Because sometimes there are things that people don't realize with, with phishing emails that quite literally every link, including that unsubscribe link, could be a phishing link. And it can potentially cause you harm. So that's probably one, one of the major uh, ways that people infiltrate is just through phishing emails. And that could be malicious attachments. This could be even going to a malicious website. 
if you're not patching your uh, browsers, for example, Chrome recently had a vulnerability in their browser that was being exploited in the wild. And they basically said, you need to update now. So by the sheer nature of visiting a website with an insecure browser could lead to a compromise of your machine. doesn't sound like this is real, but it is. Right. So phishing emails in general, those would be the first one. Uh, credential reuse would be another one. So using the same password over and over again, all sorts of different sites. And this is where that two-factor authentication piece comes into play, making sure that you're um, adding that extra level of complexity is great. Making sure you're using a password manager is even better, so preferably something from a third party, like a 1Password or a Bitwarden. Uh, I hesitate at LastPass. I'm not a big fan of them. Um, I used to be, they kind of made some weird business decisions lately. I don't recommend them anymore, but having something other than the password manager in the browser for a bunch of reasons we can talk about for those who are interested, but in general, that would be one of the other major areas where people, um, uh, would, would fall down. Um, and then finally would be again, patching, making sure that you're patching your systems regularly. Uh, you don't want to have something hanging out on the internet, be it a browser, be it a web server, be it something else that isn't at the appropriate patch level because people love to stumble across unpatched systems. And again, this is where having awareness of, of what your uh, organization looks like really, really helps because you'll be able to find those servers that are tucked under somebody's uh, desk in the office that we haven't visited for the last 18 months because we've been on lockdown and then realize that, hey, that person has done a reverse web shell going bypassing your firewall because they didn't want to, uh, to deal with, uh, with stuff. And that just happens to be publicly accessible. And now we've got a bad thing going on within our company. Those types of things. I think those would be the, the big areas uh, of concern. Yeah, and it's interesting to sort of your response or trigger something with me as well is that, you know, and, you know, how many maybe not necessarily understand this, but, you know, a lot of cybersecurity is really about the, the threats inside the organization as opposed to the threats outside the organization. Obviously, there's there's impact from both. But what have you seen in terms of sort of that ratio and, and the need for um, trying to address the, you know, sort of the internal component versus those that are trying to get into the organization from the outside. Um, because a lot of that, that security threat often is with, you know, employees just not being aware and, and um, you not being properly educated on the risks that uh, they're potentially um, putting the, the company at. It's fairly high. Um, generally, we, when we talk about uh, insider threats, people always think this is the malicious employee. This is someone who's, who's disheveled very, or not disheveled, sorry, but uh, disinterested and just has a chip on their shoulder and just wants to kind of burn this mother down, so to speak. Um, that's not really the case most of the time. Uh, a favorite phrase of mine is the road to hell is paved in good intention. What you'll find is you'll have employees that are just absolutely wanting to do the right thing and they want to do it as quickly as they can and they want to impress and make people happy and they just want to keep their jobs and that's where we run into trouble because these are the individuals that are going to respond to that email from your ceo saying hey i need you to go get me uh five thousand dollars worth of gift cards from the uh the local best buy or walmart or whatever else so that i can distribute them to employees um, I have known of organizations that have been hit with that scam more than once. And, you know, obviously the first question is, well, why? Well, the answer is because their CEO would ask for something like this, but they never thought to figure out a proper means to have that happen, like say a voice call or some other come see me in person, or in this case, a Zoom call, right? There should be procedures that go around that. So, a lot of times threats will manifest themselves because somebody has clicked on something they shouldn't have. And going back to this whole department of no, the last thing you wanna do is instill this, this uh, sense of fear within your employees that if they do something wrong, they're not gonna tell you because they're like a small child who's afraid of getting in trouble from their parent because they took the cookie from the cookie jar. 
that is the last thing we want to have happen. I saw in the comments uh, that in the chat that somebody said, what if you have a very heavy handed IT department? Well, I think you need to have a deeper discussion at higher levels to say, look, if you're causing your people to freak out every time IT comes walking down the hall or saying they want to do something, you're creating a culture of fear, which is going to heart, uh, harm and hurt your organization in the long run. Because when someone does screw something up and you find out about it because the RCMP is knocking on your door, now you've got a much bigger problem. If somebody screws something up and they're okay with admitting to it because they know they're not going to get fired from it, uh, from that decision that they made, now you have an opportunity to react and make it a much smaller incident than if, uh, if you leave it untouched and something bad is going on, right? That doesn't mean that you should rely on your users to tell you something has screwed up. You should have other controls in place to let you know. But at the same time, most people will be quick to admit that they've screwed something up. Um, if you don't, you, you're in for a longer, you know, a longer day, which is notoriously going to be Friday at five. And then especially for a long weekend like this weekend. So, you know, knock on wood, nobody screws anything up for the next couple of days, but it's inevitable. Something like this will happen. Right. So the next question I have for you, uh, very pertinent to the times that we're in right now. Um, what are some effective strategies to improve security for employees that are using personal machines while working from home? <laughs> yes, this okay. one is very, oh, this, this ranks right up there with bring your own cell phone or bring your own device to the workplace. It is the bane of existence of any security person that's out there. So the first question I would obviously ask is, why are you letting users use their machines from, from their own personal devices to access your corporate infrastructure? The general answer is usually cost or they just don't have laptops they can send home with people, or there might be liability with moving machines, um, or there's not uh, sufficient infrastructure in place to allow for, for something like that. That's okay, we're not gonna dwell on that. So going under the assumption that this is what we have, what do we do? Establish baselines for what these machines should look like. Make sure that they have modern antivirus. A lot of home users will say, well, you know what? I'm just gonna find whatever is free because I don't really care. So I'm just gonna use the free off the shelf stuff. If you're gonna expect your users to use their personal machines while working from home, give them a fighting chance give them some corporate antivirus that yes, it will probably call back into a central system that you can have visibility on, but that's kind of what you want. You want to catch things as quickly as they can. You don't want something that, hey, you know what, here's $50, go buy the latest McAfee and just install that for your home use. Because now you, again, you don't have visibility. If they have a virus, how likely are they going to tell you that they had a virus? Um, what type of virus was it? What sort of access do they have? If they're connecting from home using personal machines, are they connecting to resources at your offices? And if they are, do you have a VPN set up properly? Please tell me you're not letting them just do remote desktop directly to your office without any sort of protection in between because you might wanna double check your logs lately because that's, that's one of the common vectors that people who set up remote desktop for their offices from remote, but leave it open to the internet are prime pickings for, for people. And it comes back to that reuse of passwords and people potentially being phished and providing their credentials to, to a hacker that could then be used later on uh, to access sensitive information. If you are a SaaS only shop, you don't have the traditional Microsoft stack of Active Directory and all this other stuff. And you're just like, no, no, no. We're using Office 365. We've got Bamboo HR. We've got Salesforce that's up in the cloud. We don't host anything. We don't have to worry about any of this stuff. Great. Do you have multi-factor turned on for all of these things? Do you have a single sign-on mechanism to make things easier? What's your policy on people copying sensitive information to their local uh, desktops? Ask yourself the question, what happens when that person leaves your organization? How are you sure that they're not going to be keeping potentially sensitive information that they don't have uh, access to or shouldn't have had access to, but may have copied to their, to their desktops because eh, they're working from home? 
lots of solutions around them. Um, the best bet is trust your users and then limit access. They shouldn't have access to everything. Make sure they only have access what they need for their job. That's good practice from a number of different perspectives, but especially when we're talking about um, kind of the wild west of, of working remote as we have today. Absolutely, absolutely great advice. So the next question that I have here um, is really around sort of certification. So there's you know different standards out there, SOC 2, ISO 2701. Yep. Um, when should companies consider taking that step to get into certification? And um, what advice would you give to a company that is, um, is potentially looking to take that step and actually go through that certification process? So the first thing I would, I would recommend is understand exactly who your customers are and what the asks are going to be. If you're dealing in the financial markets, like if your targets are um, any sort of uh, bank or other financial institution, chances are very, very high they've already asked you for this. And the, the other thing is, if you're only dealing with smaller uh, businesses as well, chances are they're not going to ask you for this. The larger the client, the more likely they want to have these standardized uh, solutions. The other thing to ask yourself is, how often do you want to fill out a custom vendor questionnaire asking about your security posture and all the various controls? And it's not always just security. It can be uh, privacy as well. So for example, GDPR is a common one, or CCPA, which is the California Consumer Protection Act. Uh, Brazil has a new one. Canada is actually looking to update their privacy legislation as well. So these are all types of things people will ask. Um, and a lot of times you can bypass those things because you have a SOC 2 or you have an ISO 27001. The caveat to that is you're going to be in for a lot of work. And what I mean by that is making sure you have processes in place to deal with things like change management, making sure that when you're doing performance reviews that you have some sort of um, the process in place that you're consistent with your feedback for your employees, that your employees are aware of what's expected of them in their roles, that you're doing things like validating access control rules and stuff like this. Um, it's a lot of process related stuff. It's a lot of making sure you have that documentation. And in addition to having the documentation, making sure you're following it. So if you're doing reviews, you can't just say, well, I did a review, there was nothing to change, so we didn't change anything. Well, did you document that you did the review and that you, who, who is with you and that you found that there was nothing there? Those are the types of things that generally catch people off guard. So if you find yourself in, the, in uh, need of one of these uh, certifications, the next question is, okay, which one? If we look at SOC 2, SOC 2 is very, very popular in North America. Uh, if you're looking to the rest of the world, especially in Europe, they, they put much more emphasis on ISO as opposed to SOC. That's not to say that people will say, oh, you only have SOC? Yeah, we won't do business with you. They'll generally accept SOC as well. It's just not their first, their first pick. And then flip that around for uh, ISO in North America. So the Americans will very much, well, first of all, if you're dealing with US-based companies, they will ask, well, which NIST certification do you have? Or do you have FedRAMP? Or do you have CMMC? Like there's a bunch of very specific ones just to the US. And again, that's very much in, in the federal government. If they're dealing with other federal agencies or something like that, if you're going to say a middleman that's going to sell to someone else in the US government, these are the types of questions that they will have. Um, but generally I would recommend organizations if they do find themselves in certification land and they need compliance, go with SOC 2, go with SOC 2 type one. And I say that for a couple of reasons. One. Uh, a type one is a point in time. You basically bring the auditors in, they will look at on that particular day, were you able to give them a whole bunch of uh, documentation to prove that you've done something? If yes, great, we'll move on. Do a gap analysis before you bring them in. Most auditors will allow you to do that. I'm not gonna recommend any auditors here, uh, but do your, do your due diligence, talk to a bunch of different auditors, ask them what they can do, ask them what their rates are. You're, 
they're all pretty much similar in terms of price. None of these compliance uh, uh, frameworks are cheap. So I don't do compliance, so I, I can say this objectively, um, but find someone that you can work with. Ideally, you wanna find someone that's experienced with doing the audits as opposed to a junior auditor, because what you'll find is junior auditors are very black and white. They will focus on exactly what's been asked and nothing more. They have no wiggle room. Whereas more experienced auditors will realize, hmm, that's not really how it works in the real world. Okay, let's see and give a couple of different suggestions on different approaches that you can take. If you're not working well with an auditor that's been assigned to you, go to their superior and ask for someone else, right? Because again, that relationship is very, very important uh, that you want to have. And again, you'll find that customers will ask you for this more often than not. But I would say if you're a growing organization, if you have over 150 people, give or take, I would consider looking into it uh, just for the sake of having something to differentiate you. Or more recently, with the number of attacks that have been happening, there's been a lot more focus and emphasis, even from smaller players, on their supply chain. So if you're selling to an organization, they want to know, what have you done? Now, compliance does not equal security. Compliance basically says, we're doing the right thing based on some accounting standard that people came up with 30, 40 years ago. Uh, and yeah, it, it's great. We paid a bunch of money to someone to tell everybody else how good we are. So think about that for a minute. You pay someone to get a piece of paper to tell the rest of the world that, yes, these people are doing the right thing. So there, there are good things that come from compliance, but they shouldn't be the only thing that you do in terms of, uh, of a cybersecurity initiative. It's, it's in, my, in my eyes, it's more of a cost of business thing more than anything else. Excellent. And so that sort of segues a little bit into the next question I have for you. Um, so when should a company begin to think about uh, using an outside service for their cybersecurity practice versus trying to build that expertise in-house? If you have someone who's interested in doing it in-house and they have experience doing it, then by all means, leverage that. If they are running into situations where they're not quite sure where to begin or they kind of know what they want to do, but they don't really know how best to do it, uh, it never hurts to have a second opinion. Um, a lot of times what we'll find with organizations is they literally wait for a customer to come in and say, hey, you may want to do something along these lines or nice product you have here. When was the last time you guys did a test against it to check its, its uh, security? And those are what we refer to as penetration tests or you know, what have you done to ensure our data remains safe? And the, the answer is most of the time, well, we haven't done that, but let's, let's quickly find somebody to see what we can do to, to, uh, to kind of help, help move that, that around. Um, for those types of situations, they want that third party uh, expertise. So in, in certain situations, you're going to have to find someone outside of you because they want that independent opinion. Very similar to the SOC 2 or the ISO 27001, um, they're looking for a third party to attest to you um, following the appropriate standards. If you have someone in-house that's really interested in doing this, fantastic. Go, go forth and, and nurture them, get them the necessary training that they need, um, kind of go from there. If you have absolutely no idea where to begin, but you know that you have to do something, then find someone who can sit down with you, kind of under, understand what your needs are, and then work out from there and figure out okay, what is, what is the shortcomings in your current program? And if, if the answer is we have nothing, that's okay. We all have to start somewhere. Uh, admitting that you have nothing is probably the great first step. The most dangerous thing is assuming that you have everything under control and everything is fine. I've been doing this for a long time. I still don't have full control and full visibility and full everything that I would like to see um, anywhere I've ever worked. Um, and so instead, what we do is we pick our battles and we try to find what is the most impact because there is this law of diminishing returns. I'm not going to spend $100,000 to protect a $5,000 system. It just doesn't make sense. So we try to find 
what are the critical areas? What are the con critical controls that we have? But most importantly, do we have fundamentals in place? Do we have those table stakes in place? And do, can we do that appropriately? That's kind of the, the big area um, that I would recommend anyone to really start. Excellent, excellent. Um, so we're running up to, to three o'clock here. Um, I did wanna give you an opportunity though. Um, is there anything we maybe haven't touched on uh, over the course of, of the past sort of 55 minutes that you want to share with the audience, uh, sort of last parting thoughts of, of things that they should consider from a cybersecurity standpoint? Uh, the biggest thing I want to recommend that people keep in mind is uh, cybersecurity isn't really something that is distinct to one particular group within your organizations. This is something that should be on the forefront of everyone's mind, but most importantly, it has to, in order for it to really be successful, you need to have buy-in from your executive. And if you are one of these internal champions that wants to increase security within your own organization, don't go at them with, look at all the threats that can happen to us. Like we have this technical issue that we have, we have that technical issue that we have or whatever else. Go at them from a business perspective. Hey, did you know that 53% of small businesses have actually been attacked in the last year and because they lacked a particular cybersecurity control resulting in X number of percentage profits lost, right? Do your research. There's a great report that comes out from Verizon that they actually released recently. I just haven't had a chance to review it this year, which is the Verizon data breach uh, report, the DBIR. Uh, data breach investigation report, I believe it's what it stands for. It's fantastic. It's, it's a very easy read, especially for non-technical people, but it does break down what threats look like, who they're targeting, what the initial attack vectors look like. It's fantastic when you're dealing with the executives and you want to really ra raise awareness from a business perspective on what the potential harm is to an organization. And that can be a lot more eye-opening than you know, spewing out technical facts about Russia or China coming to uh, steal uh, all the data in the middle of the night. Excellent. So uh, thank you very much for your time today, John. Um, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we're, we're sort of running out of time here, but um, mm -hmm. really appreciate you taking the time and, um, and sharing your, your insights and your thoughts with us. I think you've uh, certainly give us, given us all a lot of things to consider and think about. And, uh, and hopefully for those in the audience, um, you were able to take some things away uh, to help you in terms of considering uh, your own sort of cybersecurity practice within your organization. If you do have any further questions um, or you want to learn more in terms of um, you know, how Communic Tech can kind of help from a, your own sort of cybersecurity efforts, um, please reach out to your, your uh, Communic Tech advisor and they will certainly connect you with um, folks. Uh, we have uh, um, John and, and some other folks within our pro squad that um, sort of deal in the cyber area. So we can connect you with the right individuals to sort of have a deeper discussion and, and a more fulsome discussion about your organization specifically and some of the particular things that you need to, uh, you need to consider. So so um, with that, uh, I think we will uh, leave it there. Again, John, thank you very much for your time. Greatly appreciate you joining us today. No problem, Chris. Thanks for having me. And thank you for everybody for joining us as well. We'll talk to you again on in the next AMA.